when I'm building a computer, I always start with the schematic. And what you see on the screen is a fairly standard three bus microcomputer design using the first three chips from the Intel MCS80 platform. I've got the 8080 microprocessor, the 8224 clock generator, and the 8228 bus controller. The 8228 provides 10 milliamps of data and control bus drive on each pin, and I've added a set of 74LS367 bus drivers, which provide about 24 milliamps drive on each address line. I'll be hand wiring the circuit board for this computer, and I like having the extra headroom on the address bus that these 367s provide. A 20 megahertz crystal is the resonator for the 8224 which has an internal divide by 9 clock generator and that provides an approximately 2.2 megahertz clock for the 8080. The reset delay is determined by R1C1 and uh, it gives me around 200 milliseconds of uh, reset delay and that's plenty of delay for the switching power supply to come up, the uh, power rails to stabilize and all of the peripherals I have to attached to this computer to complete their internal reset sequences. The reset switch down here is connected to C1 and pushing the button discharges C1 and starts the reset cycle. The 8080 requires a multipolar power supply. You've got plus 5, minus 5, and plus 12. Uh, and in addition, the 8224 requires plus 5 and plus 12. Now this works out great for me, the plus 12 does, because the LEDs in these switches are 12 volts, so I can use the 12 volts to light up the switches whenever they're actuated. For memory, this computer uses a 32-kilobyte flash ROM and two 32-kilobyte static RAMs. One challenge with the 8080 is that program execution out of reset starts at address zero. Many of the 8080 machines built in the 70s used front panel switches to program and control the computer and didn't have a need really for ROM chips for permanently stored programs. You could put the 8080 into a halt state, enter your program directly into the RAM using the front panel switches, and then place the 8080 in a run state at address zero. A lot of software written for these machines requires RAM at address zero to operate. This includes many basic interpreters and operating systems like CPM. So if you aren't loading programs through the front panel and you want to use a monitor program stored in ROM that has to start at address zero, how do you get RAM at address zero? Well, there's a number of different ways, and I'll describe the one I came up with for this design. Let's take a look at the memory decoder. The ROM and RAM chips are 32K, so address 0 through A14, A0 through A14, are used. So you can see A0 through A14 are all connected to all three of these chips. And that leaves um, address A15 the only one that's available as a chip select. And it can only select two out of these three chips, but which ones? When the 8080 comes out of reset, U14.1 D flip-flop has been reset so that its Q output is low and its not Q output is high. A15 up here will be low when the CPU starts and remain low for addresses 0 through 7FFF. A15 is connected to U10.2 down here. That's a 74LS00 NAND chip, and it's wired as an inverter. So A15 gets converted from a low to a high on the output. And it's connected to the input of another NAND gate, U10.3. The non-Q output of U14.1 is also high, so it's high at this time after reset, which activates the output of the NAND gate, U10.3, and turns on ROM0. So we've got a 0 here. We've got a 1, okay, well there's one half of what we need to activate this chip. And this Q output after reset is a 1. So now we've got an active output on 74LS00, this uh, U10.3, and that's connected all the way up here to ROM0. So ROM0 starts off at address 0. 
A15 up here is also connected, if you follow this path, to this uh, U12.1. And that's an exclusive NOR gate. The exclusive NOR output, it can only be active in two states, when one of its inputs is high and the other is low. So if both inputs are high or both inputs are low, the exclusive NOR output is not active. So you either got to have a 1 here and a 0 here, or a 0 here and a 1 down here. The other input of U12.1 is connected to the Q output of 14.1. After reset, this is 0, remember. So it, after reset, we've got a 0 here. And when A15 over here is high, it's connected here, you're going to have a 0 here and a 1 here. That activates this output or of U14.1, or U12.1, and it's connected all the way up here to RAM0. So anytime you've got a 1 on address 15, you're going to end up with an active output on 12.1, and that will turn on our RAM chip, RAM0. So RAM0 now starts at 8,000. So we've got ROM0 starting at 0, and RAM0 starting at 8,000. So what about RAM 1? Let's take a look at that. Where is its output connected? So that's its chip enable. So all the way down here. Oh, it's just connected to this 74LS00, 10.4. So remember when we talked about after reset, this is a low. So this input on this, on this NAND gate is a low. So it doesn't matter what we get on uh, pin 13 of U10.4. No matter whether this is 0 or 1, this output is never going to be active. So it, it, RAM 1, after reset, is not addressable. It is nowhere in the address space. It may as well be removed from the computer altogether. We don't want to do that, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is, for all intents and purposes, not accessible. Now, let's talk about what happens after uh, an I.O. write. Just remember that after reset, ROM 0 is at address 0 to 7FFF, and RAM 0 is active from address 8000 to FFFF, and RAM 1 is not active on any 8080 address. Notice that the clock input of U14.1 at D flip-flop is connected to the I.O. write signal, and that the D input is connected to 5 volts. So essentially this D input is always at a 1. When the I.O. write signal becomes active, this high input on D is clocked into this Q output. So Q will be high, not Q will be low. So any I.O. write to anywhere is going to cause this transition to occur. This D input that's a high is going to be clocked into this Q output. And that's going to flip the states. After, uh, on reset, you've got a 0 and a 1. After your first I.O. write, you're going to have a 1 and a 0. Let's see how that changes the memory decode action that I've just described. Notice that when the not Q output of Q14.1, this one right here, if this goes low, there is no value of A15 that will turn on ROM0. Because this, this is connected right here. This is the output line driving ROM0. So Q is going to go low after an IO write. When, this, when, this, uh, when pin 9 is low, it doesn't matter what pin 10 is. It will never, there's no 1 or 0 that you can put here that's going to activate uh, ROM 0. So ROM 0, after I.O. write, is effectively removed from the address bus. There's no, there's no 8080 address that will activate ROM 0. So it, it, it essentially has become like RAM 1. It's no longer addressable. But now that we have the Q output of 14.1 high, let's take a look at what happens to RAM 0. So we've got a high here, and that's tied to A15. Let's just say we've got a high here. If A15 is a low, then 12.1 is active, and that turns on RAM 0. So essentially now at this point, RAM 0 assumes address 0 through 7FFF. Let's take a look at what happens to RAM 1. 
So here's our address line. Let's just say we have a one here because right now we have a, a one out of this Q output of 14.1. This one, great, I'm halfway to turning this NAND gate on. When I have a one on address 15, then the output of 10.4 is active and I've just enabled RAM one. So RAM one is now at address 8,000. The first time an IO write occurs, ROM zero is no longer addressable. But RAM zero has now taken its place. RAM zero is now active between address zero to seven FFF. And RAM one, which was previously not addressable, is now addressable from 8,000 to FFFF. Following that IO write, the entire 8080 address space is 64K of RAM. And this state is permanent until a hard reset occurs. When the reset button is pushed or power is reset, then the flip-flop gets reset and you've got ROM zero at address zero and you've got uh, RAM zero at address at 8,000. And then uh, when you have your first IO write, they're gonna switch places. RAM zero is gonna be at address zero. It's gonna start at address zero. And RAM one is gonna start at address 8,000. For this to be usable, the first thing I do in my monitor is I have the, the monitor here at ROM0 make a copy of itself into RAM0. And once that copy is completed, it does an I.O. write. And that's going to move RAM0 in its place, in RAM1 in the place of RAM0. And the program will continue to execute as though it was in ROM. And that's what my monitor program does during initialization. It'll make a copy of itself and then execute an IO write. And you'll, you'll see some of that code as, as when, we, when I get to that point. The remainder of this design is a, a UART a chip starting at uh, IO address zero and a 128 megabyte flash drive starting at address 40. This, these, those are IO addresses. The UART clock here at the top, 1.8432 megahertz, that, uh, along with prescaler of this UART chip, will give me a baud rate between 300 and 19,200. I typically just go as fast as I can go, 19,200. But I do have the other baud rates available to me if I ever need to use them. But I typically just stick it at 19.2 and let it run. The, uh, the I.O. side of the UART is connected to a header, and that header can be uh, connected to a, a USB to TTL cable. So if we got a USB to TTL cable to start with, you can plug that in. And then once you're through with all of your testing and debugging, uh, I've included in the design an RS-232 converter. This is um, a single chip that's got its own switching power supply on board so it can generate its own positive and negative voltages. For, uh, for the out, the outbound side of the RS-232 connector. And using a couple of little jumper pins, I can jumper in from here to here, and I can connect that to the RS-232 converter. And then, and then on the output side, I can use a USB to RS-232 connector and, uh, and use this as a buffer. Uh, anytime I've got signals going off board, I really prefer to use a, a buffer uh, so that I, I don't have the risk of something going wrong outside the machine causing failures inside the machine. At least I can reduce the probability of it as much as possible. I've done the same thing for the IDE interface. I'm using a 128 megabyte flash card. That compact flash card has an IDE adapter that it's plugged into. And that IDE adapter gives me these uh, signal lines in and out. And I use a set of buffers. Again, this, these connections go off board, so I prefer to use a set of buffers to drive those connections for that peripheral that's off board. It's just a safety and headroom just thing. Safety and head I'm using thing. data 0 through 7. Typically, IDE is 16-bit transfers. And what most people do when they're using a hard drive or a flash drive is uh, they don't wire in the upper eight bits. They just wire in the lower eight bits, and and um, and half of the storage isn't used. And 
Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. The compact flashcards I've been using uh, have an 8-bit transfer mode. What I do is I put the compact flashcard in 8-bit mode for 8-bit transfers, and then I can use the whole card. More on that later in the following videos. Well, that's the design of the computer. The next step is to lay out the circuit board and then hand wire all the circuit connections. I'm going to uh, load a monitor program into ROM0 and then start testing and see how it works. More on that in an upcoming video.